the United States Penitentiary, Florence, Maximum Security Prison, sits a former FBI agent serving 15 consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Robert Philip Hansen was charged under the Espionage Act in 2001 after it was discovered he had sold US intelligence documents to the Soviet Union and its successor Russia for the last 25 years. The US Department of Justice described his work as the worst intelligence disaster in US history. Hansen was so good at what he did that despite their best efforts, the KGB never even knew the identity of their greatest source. But how did the Federal Bureau of Investigation allow one of its agents to sell state secrets to their Cold War adversary for so long without being caught? Robert Hansen was born in Chicago in 1944. He initially applied to be a cryptographer for the NSA, but was immediately denied due to budget setbacks. He then went on to study business and received an MBA in accounting and information systems. After working at an accounting firm for a single year, Robert quit his job and joined the Chicago Police Department, taking on the role of an internal affairs investigator. Robert had a knack for forensic accounting. Four years later, he had left the police department and took a more prestigious role working for the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Now a special agent at the start of 1976, he was transferred to a field office in Indiana for two years before being transferred to the office in New York. This is where he got his first taste of the intelligence community. Hansen's superiors tasked him with compiling a database of Soviet intelligence for the FBI. Less than a year later, he approached GRU, the Soviet main intelligence directorate, and offered his services his sole motivation being money. Hansen compiled details of the FBI's booking activities, FBI lists of suspected Soviet spies, and various other documents. He then handed them over to the GRU. A number of these documents contained names of Soviet double agents working for the CIA, one of them being a general in the Soviet army, by the name of Dmitry Polyakov. Operating under the code name Bourbon, Dmitry Polikov, a Soviet Major General, high-ranking GRU officer and a Cold War spy revealed countless Soviet secrets to both the CIA and the FBI. Polyakov initially approached the FBI in 1959, declaring himself a Russian patriot who was disgusted by the corruption of the Soviet Communist Party, seeking its downfall. Soon after becoming a double agent, Polyakov returned to Moscow, where as a GRU officer he had access to numerous documents and state secrets. Working for the FBI and CIA for over 25 years, he rose to the rank of Major General. His work led to the investigation of double agents operating in the West, such as Jack Dunlap and Frank Bassard. Despite having been exposed as a mole by Hansen's documents in 1979, he was not arrested until a further betrayal by CIA mole Aldrich Ames in 1986. Polyakov was convicted of treason and executed two years later in 1988. He never got to see the fall of the Communist Party he so dearly hated. The CIA described his execution as a bad day for us when we lost him and the best source of intelligence the American intelligence community ever had. The US had lost their greatest double agent and was still completely oblivious to the identity of the mole that exposed him. Hansen continued to deceive the West after being transferred to FBI headquarters in Washington DC. His latest posting in the budget office granted him access to unprecedented levels of intelligence information involving many FBI operations. He collected intelligence regarding wiretapping, electronic surveillance and double agents. Of course this information was sent straight to Moscow. In 1984 Hansen was transferred to the Soviet Analytical Unit, very convenient for his enterprise. This special unit was tasked with studying, identifying, tracking and capturing Soviet spies operating within the United States of America. One year later, Hansen was transferred back to New York, albeit continuing his work on Soviet counterintelligence. Immensely ironic. Hansen's next contact with the KGB was on October 1st, 1985. He once again offered his services and exposed three more KGB agents who were working for the FBI. In the letter, he listed his sole demand, 100,000 US dollars in cash. Boris Yuzin, Valery Martinov, and Sergei Motorin were all arrested in Moscow. They were tried for espionage and found guilty. Yuzin served six years in prison. Martinov and Motorin were executed with a single gunshot to the back of the head. This is where things get slightly comical, as in 1987 the FBI recalled Hansen to the headquarters in Washington DC and tasked him with finding the man who had exposed Yuzin, 
Martinov and Mulderin. He was looking for himself. Hansen was very careful with his investigation not to uncover or highlight any sliver of evidence that could point in his direction. 1989 was the beginning of Hansen's downfall. Felix Bloch, the Director of European and Canadian Affairs in the United States Department of State, was under investigation for espionage. Once Hansen learned of this, he immediately contacted the KGB, who in turn abruptly ceased all communication with Bloch. The FBI were unable to prove espionage against Bloch, and he was thus never charged. Unbeknownst yet to Hansen and the FBI, this would have serious repercussions. The failure of the Bloch investigation jump-started the FBI's investigation into how the KGB found out about the suspicions of espionage against Bloch. They were now certain they had a high-ranking mole in the Bureau. For the remainder of 1989 and 1990, Hansen drip-fed the KGB intelligence information including details on American measurement and signal intelligence, the plan to use radar and satellites to intercept signals. On two separate occasions, he sold a complete list of American double agents living in the Soviet Union. Towards the end of 1990, one FBI agent began to suspect Hansen as the elusive mole, his own brother-in-law, Mark Walk. His brother-in-law had heard of various piles of cash being found around Hansen's house, and the constant talk of retiring to Poland raised questions. Despite contacting his supervisor, the FBI dismissed Mark's theory, and no investigation proceeded. By now, the collapse of the Soviet Union was imminent. Worried about being exposed, Hansen cut ties with the KGB handlers. This helped quash any lingering suspicions as to his allegiances. Once the newly founded Russian Federation had taken over the former Soviet intelligence agencies, Hansen took a big risk and contacted the GRU. He agreed to go to the Russian embassy and meet a GRU officer in the underground car park. He approached the officer holding a package and described himself as a dissatisfied FBI agent. He identified himself by his Soviet codename, Ramon Garcia. The GRU officer didn't buy the story and sped off. Soon the Russian government filed a grievance with the US State Department, accusing them of setting up a triple agent. But once again, Hansen evaded capture, despite having approached the GRU officer in person and disclosing himself as an FBI agent. Hansen remained relatively quiet until 1994, when he crested a transfer to the National Counterintelligence Center. However, upon finding out that he must take a lie detector test, he changed his mind. Three years later, an FBI mole by the name of Earl Edwin Pitts expressed his suspicions of Hansen. Although being the second FBI agent to suspect Hansen, no investigation proceeded. In an unrelated incident, Hansen's computer failed and IT personnel from the IIS unit were sent to investigate. They quickly impounded the computer after discovering it had been tampered with and a program used to crack passwords had been installed by Hansen. Hansen fabricated a cover story that claimed he had used the program to gain the password for the color printer and the FBI bought it. He was let go with a warning. Now confident he was not under any investigation, he once again reached out to the SVR, the successor of the KGB, in 1999 and provided many more state secrets. He performed incriminating searches of FBI files using his own name, something he would soon regret. It's widely believed that Hansen would have been apprehended much earlier if not for the complications of Aldridge Amos, who had been operating at the same time. The FBI blamed much of Hansen's exposures on Ames once they caught him in 1994. Ames' arrest seemed to explain much of the assets leaked and the executions of Martinov and Motorin. However, the block investigation could not be connected with Ames, and so suspicions of a second mole remained. The FBI and CIA joined forces in 1994 seeking to uncover the second mole, who they called Greysuit. A list of suspects was compiled. Many suspects were cleared and others were uncovered as previously unknown double agents working for Russia. Hansen once again escaped, mainly because the investigation made the assumption that the mole must be a CIA employee rather than an FBI employee. It was now 1998 and the operation had zeroed in on Brian Kelly, a CIA operative. They accused him of being the mole and even interrogated his wife and kids. However, all denied it. Kelly remained falsely accused until Hansen's arrest. Progress was made in the right direction when the FBI paid $7 million to a former KGB agent by the name of Alexander Sherbakov. He provided an audio tape between a KGB agent and an operative called B. Hansen's name was never mentioned in the tapes, but something else was. 
the purple pissing Japanese. This one phrase, albeit a very odd and unique one, would lead to Hansen's downfall. Michael Wagspack, an FBI agent part of the investigation, felt the voice was familiar, and upon finding notes on the mole about using a quote from General George S. Patton about the purple pissing Japanese, remembered Robert Hansen saying the same thing. He listened to the tape again and instantly recognised Hansen's voice. They had a strong lead and Hansen's location and dates matched the activities of the mole during the period. He was quickly placed under surveillance. They soon discovered he was in contact with the Russians. In December 2000, the FBI employed an unusual tactic and promoted Hansen along with assigning him a new job, FBI Supervisor of Computer Security. They wanted to keep him away from sensitive data. Along with this new job came an office and an assistant, Eric O'Neill. O'Neill was not an assistant, but was in fact an FBI surveillance specialist tasked with watching Hansen. After some time, O'Neill managed to download Hansen's personal digital assistant data and provided the FBI with their smoking gun. Hansen was becoming suspicious and thought his car to be bugged. He wrote to the Russians and claimed he was promoted to a do-nothing job and that something has aroused the sleeping tiger. All of this did not stop Hansen from continuing to supply the information he already had. On February 18, 2001, Hansen drove to Foxstone Park in Virginia and placed a white piece of tape on a park sign, clearly a signal to his Russian counterpart. He then taped a garbage bag full of files and information under a wooden footbridge that crossed the creek. What he didn't know is that the FBI were still watching him. Upon realizing what Hansen was doing, the FBI agents rushed in and caught Hansen red-handed. After being caught, Hansen exclaimed, What took you so long? Hansen pleaded guilty to all charges on July 6, 2001 in a bid to escape the death penalty. As a result, he was convicted of 13 counts of espionage, one count of attempted espionage, and one of conspiracy to commit espionage. He was sentenced to 15 consecutive life sentences without parole. Robert Philip Hansen, prisoner number 48551-083, currently resides in a supermax prison in solitary confinement for 23 hours a day.